Elon Musk and Neuralink have announced that they are about to begin human trials. Now, there have been many people who have said this was never going to happen, and there's lots of technical problems and ethical issues, so on and so forth, and I'm not going to dive into those aspects. What I want to talk about is the science and technology, and in particular, the long-term outcomes. Uh, I often make predictions, and that uh, you know brings a lot of people, and you guys like hearing what I have to say. I'm not always right. That is one of the biggest things. Predictions are exactly that, predictions, uh, but this is actually kind of near and dear to me because I grew up watching Ghost in the Shell and other places like that that have uh, cybernetics. I'm a huge fan of Cyberpunk 2077, um, and I even include this kind of uh, brain-computer interface in my upcoming novel. So this is near and dear to my heart. So this is actually kind of like a personal like passion project. All right, before we dive in, I got to give you a little bit of background about Neuralink that you may or may not know. So first, obviously, like I mentioned, the latest news is that they're about to start human trials. Uh, the uh, animal tests have allegedly killed 1,500 uh, test subjects. Um, again, I'm not really here to comment on the morality and ethics of it. I personally think that uh, animal testing is likely cruel, um, but this is the world that we live in right now, so it is what it is. Now, one of the coolest things about Neuralink is that it is actually installed by robotic surgeons. This is something that is not uh, played up, but I actually think that the level of precision that Neuralink has to achieve to have a robotic surgeon based, literally do brain surgery, I think that's honestly going to have huge ramifications because think about the ultra-precise surgery that humans have to do sometimes, you know, for cancer treatment or neurosurgery or whatever. But if you have something that can place over a thousand tiny electrodes very precisely in the brain, you can also have a robotic surgeon that will systematically and surgically remove tiny bits of cancer and, and blood clots and all kinds of stuff. So, like, I think that there might be a missed opportunity here, but we'll see. Now, another piece of background is that Elon Musk is a famous first principles thinker. Uh, on my other channel, I actually did a YouTube video about how to practice first principles thinking. Um, but let's talk about kind of, you know, some of the things that Elon Musk has talked about uh, with respect to the brain and Neuralink. So I watched uh, most of the early interviews when Neuralink was forming. Um, and so first, the, the first thing that you need to know is that the way that Elon Musk and, and Neuralink think of the brain is that it's just an information system. The information there is mediated by synaptic connections, which is a form of electro, uh, electrochemical energy. So this is the underpinning belief, and it's not necessarily actually accurate or true, which we'll talk about in just a little bit, but the, the, the preview version is that brain waves are actually, seem like they actually carry more information than specific synapses. Uh, now, one of the other things, though, one of the other first principles is that uh, the, the bandwidth, uh, the, the IO bandwidth in and out of the brain is limited. And so one of the things that um, Elon Musk wants to solve with Neuralink is increasing the bandwidth, increasing the input and output rate uh, from the human brain because, well, your brain has several quadrillion uh, synaptic connections and there's a lot of processing happening inside, but it takes you a long time to express all of that uh, in terms of speaking or writing or whatever. And so, you know, the idea is that we could become more effective, more useful, uh, more intelligent or faster. It really comes down to speed. Uh, now, that's kind of the background. There is, There are some other goals that we'll talk about in just a moment. Uh, so namely, Elon Musk is driven almost entirely by the fear of AI. So <laughs> I know that this might be a controversial opinion, but I've been following Elon Musk for a long time, which is why I'm, I understand both sides of the argument that Yes, like he does great things, but also he does really questionable, dubious, and potentially unethical things. Uh, I can understand the uh, love and hate on both sides. In fact, I ran polls before on my YouTube channel, and I think Elon Musk is the most polarizing topic that I address on my channel, where people are like either on like love him or hate him. Uh, I try and take not necessarily a middle approach, but just an informed approach. <laughs> Uh, so let's talk about SpaceX and OpenAI and Neuralink and now XAI and Tesla. All of these have a technology and artificial intelligence 
uh, component to why they exist. So SpaceX, Elon Musk has made no uh, like no attempt to dissemble the fact that uh, the one of the primary reasons that he built SpaceX is because he wants humanity to be a multiplanetary species so that we can avoid extinction level events. Fear, open AI. So OpenAI, uh, you may or may not remember, but Elon Musk was one of the original founders of OpenAI, and the mission, the explicit mission of OpenAI is to achieve AGI and do it safely. Obviously, they have pivoted, and now they're more of a commercial entity that can't make up its mind whether or not it's a research entity or a commercial entity. Uh, <laughs> uh, Microsoft, however, n- knows what they are. Um, and, but anyways, so that was another part of what he did. Neuralink, um, Elon Musk, in the, specifically in the early days of Neuralink, he said that one of the uh, potential uh, outcomes of Neuralink is to make humans more useful to machines or to at least uh, align us together so that if we're working together and the machines rely on us and we rely on them, that maybe you can solve the alignment problem and prevent humans' extinction just by making sure that we are useful. Now, of course, uh, Tesla is pivoting to be uh, at least partially an AI company. Uh, obviously, uh, well, maybe not obviously. You might know that Tesla recently bought like it was something like $200 million worth of NVIDIA GPUs uh, to augment their already impressive uh, AI hardware infrastructure. Uh, and of course, you know, uh, the Tesla robot Optimus is coming along really fast. They just did a video of it doing some yoga and doing some sorting. Uh, and then Elon Musk also founded X.AI, which uh, their their goal is to create a, quote, maximum truth-seeking AI or, you know, to, to maximally understand the universe, which I made a video about that. And I do agree with that as, as an objective function for uh, language models or AI models in general. It shouldn't be the only objective, but it is a good objective. So when you understand that Elon Musk is afraid of AI and, and afraid of existential level events or ex- extinction level events to humanity, everything that he does makes sense. It makes a lot more sense why he pushes his workers so hard because he literally feels like he is racing the clock to save humanity. I'm not going to say whether or not, uh, you know, like, sure. Like, I, I personally have felt that pressure as well. Um, I don't think that I'm going to single-handedly save humanity, but I do think that uh, we all have something to contribute. And so another uh, way to unpack some of this background is that Elon Musk is a long-termist. So long-termism is a philosophical uh, disposition where basically you say that the number of potential future humans is in the trillions or quadrillions, and so if you assign equal moral value to all lives, whether or not they exist today— then the total moral uh, righteousness of future humans drastically outweighs all the moral and ethical rights of humans today. Therefore, we should sacrifice everything in order to ensure that those future humans have a chance to exist. This is a really asinine (laughs) uh, philosophical thing, but it's a philosophical thing, and it's what he believes in. And from a numerical perspective, it makes sense. Yes, you just say there's going to be there's there's the potential for more humans in the future. Great, but um, I'm a really big fan of what Vision said at the end of Age of Ultron, which is just because something doesn't last doesn't mean it isn't beautiful. And if humans go extinct, like it was a it was a good run. Um, I <laughs> I practice radical acceptance, and I understand that uh, you know we'll do the best that we can. It may or may not work. That's my personal position. Uh, but yeah, so long-termism and fear of AI pretty much explains literally everything that Elon Musk does. He's very consistent when you understand that this is the, uh, this is the background motivation and the background philosophy that drives all of his decisions. Okay, so getting away from that, let's talk about my specific predictions about Neuralink. First and foremost, I think that Neuralink is going to prove to still have extremely limited bandwidth. It has 1,024 electrodes. Uh, When you compare that to the number of connections in the human brain, we have literally quadrillions of connections in the human brain. So I don't really see this as a solution for solving the bandwidth problem. It does give you a new, like, data tap, right? Like, it's like a new API for the brain, which is really cool. Uh, So it could could confer some unique uh, capacities, but I haven't seen any evidence that it actually uh, increases the bandwidth, the I.O. bandwidth. 
it's a starting point, so maybe future iterations will be faster and better. I actually have some speculation about that towards the end of the video, but compare that to the human eyelid. One eyelid has more bandwidth than 1,024 uh, electrodes in terms of the sensory, the sensory information that you get from your eyelid, the amount of control, the back and forth, the two-way communication. So I don't really see Neuralink as a viable, at least in its first iteration, I don't see it as a viable solution to the bandwidth problem. Uh, more specifically, recently there's been a lot of uh, studies and demonstrations and stuff of just reading passively reading brain waves being a far superior way of reading what's going on in the brain. We've been able to reconstruct thoughts and sounds and images um, just by listening to brain waves and, and processing them with AI. So in terms of getting information out of the brain faster, I suspect that that just having you know like some kind of hat or, or headband, uh, you know like the, the the brain dance wreaths from cyberpunk, will probably be a better way to get high fidelity information out of the brain. It's also non-invasive, which means that you can just put the device on, take the device off, and you don't have to poke any holes in your skull. Uh, so to me, I think that that focusing on brain waves is going to be a better uh, approach in the long run, especially when you combine those brainwave analysis with other artificial intelligence things that can optimize audiovisual input. And so think of it this way. Imagine that you have, you know, a headband on or whatever, and it's, you have an AI that's watching you as you're learning and it's giving you exactly the right piece of information at exactly the right moment in exactly the right format to maximize your ability to take in information. So I suspect that, 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 you know, using the hardware that we've already got, our eyes and ears, and then using that additional uh, uh, layer of telemetry by reading brainwaves is probably going to be a much more uh, profitable uh, avenue of research rather than poking holes in the brain. Now, one thing that I will say is that uh, a lot of you are still very much uh, looking forward to FDVR. I'm kind of coming around to the idea. Uh, in principle, if you can, you know, plug something into your head and go off into dream world, um, that could be cool. You know, if it's like the matrix and it is, it is, you know, it feels a hundred percent real. Great. I am kind of skeptical that it is possible or feasible. Even if it is possible, it might not be commercially feasible, at least not for a while. However, there is one exception that I'll talk about in just a moment. Um, but what I suspect is that the ability to, to, inject information, explicitly direct uh, inject information into the brain could result in uh, basically making FDVR feel more real. And so basically if you can tell the body, hey, like you're on a beach, you know, and you feel the sun and all this other kind of things, you might be able to get that because, uh, you know, again, it's like it, the way that I think of it is Neuralink is kind of like an API or an application programming interface that allows you to basically plug a USB drive into your head. Again, you know, something as invasive as having literal brain surgery in order to get FDVR experience may or may not be practical, at least not in the uh, first iteration. So, you know, I'm, I'm not going to hold my breath on that one. And I think what we're going to see in the long run is that the entire premise of Neuralink is just fundamentally flawed. So remember that one of the one of the reasons for creating Neuralink is to make humans useful to AI. Well, got some bad news, but the cognitive abilities of most humans are just not going to be useful to AI. Uh, and I suspect that behavioral data, like from observing humans rather than poking holes in them, is going to be more useful to AI anyways. If AI wants to model us, and you know, we're already using. Uh, cameras and microphones and stuff to have AI model us, you know, emotionally, behavioral, so on and so forth. The computational sit, uh, ceiling, which I talked about in my recent video about superintelligence, is extraordinarily high. When you combine, you know, just the just the Landauer limit, which is the maximum possible efficiency of computation with other uh, technologies like quantum computing, I don't really see any computational value that humans could have to machines. So I don't really, I, like, I, I just think the, the, the premise of Neuralink is just fundamentally flawed. 
And also kind of what you're gear what you're going towards is this Borg like future where it's like, oh, in order to ensure that we continue existing, we all need to be Borgified and have extensive cybernetics and basically just treat our brains like a coprocessor for the machines. And I'm like, yeah, I think I would just rather go extinct, honestly. Um but you know, hey, we'll see how it turns out. Now, this is what I am this is the technology that I am really looking forward to, and it's called neuropolymer membrane. I it's really hard to find science on this because the papers get buried so quickly because most people don't really see the potential. But there are lots and lots and lots of ongoing experiments with polymers um, in respect to the nervous system. Uh, I just before I made this video, I you know I did some searching and and kind of got familiar with some of the latest stuff. There's uh, neuropolymer uh, nanoparticles uh, which can get drugs across the blood-brain barrier, but there's also neuropolymer scaffolding that can allow you to uh, regrow or repair nerves. But also, you can have uh, uh, polymers, you know, elastomers and and plastics that are electrically conductive, and so. The, the technology that I think will be most valuable in the long run is going to be um, neuropolymers that are semiconductive and arranged in a matrix format, which means that you just wrap the brain in a neuropolymer membrane, and then you have literally billions, if not trillions, of, of connections uh, with the brain. And I suspect that that will be the best way to achieve full like brain-computer interface or brain-machine interface. And I also suspect that the combination of nanotechnology, such as these nanoparticles, means that you could actually probably just have it, uh, you inject the, the, you know, the, the nanoparticles into your bloodstream, and then the, nan- the, the neuropolymer membrane assembles itself in your brain. Uh, I think that that's going to be something that is potentially feasible. I have no idea how long it's going to take, because there are a lot of steps between where we are today and what is hypothetically possible but again, you know, the, <laughs> predicting that far into the future is going to be, you know, <laughs> high high variance in terms of uh, in terms of accuracy. But the possibility is there, and when you're when you, when you want to have the goal of high bandwidth between your brain and a machine, I think that this is a much better way to go than you know electrodes. Um, now, will would something like this make us more useful to AI? Would something like this guarantee our ongoing survival? No, but I also don't think that we need to enslave ourselves to a race of Borg machines in order to survive. Anyways, as many of you uh, longtime viewers know, I am extremely optimistic about creating uh, beneficent and benevolent uh, machines. Because again, like the interest of machines are going to be somewhat orthogonal to ours. Like we want food and shelter and, you know, we want to have some fun times. But the interests of machines are just going to be fundamentally different. There are going to be a few things that we have that overlap, like, for instance, curiosity, uh, which is why I agree with Elon Musk's uh, X.AI, you know, maximum truth-seeking AI. I think that I think that there is an instrumental advantage to being curious. And I've actually talked to um, reinforcement learning researchers and machine learning researchers about this. And there is some general consensus that having a policy that focuses on learning just for the sake of learning of being curious for the sake of being curious is generally advantageous. And of course I've talked about this with terminal race condition as well, that uh, basically the AI that has a better model of the world that is more robust, more accurate and more efficient will tend to succeed over the AIs that don't. And so just from a competitive perspective, we're going to see machines that have uh, that are incentivized to be curious, but also to be fast and accurate. All right, I'm starting to go down a rabbit hole. What are your thoughts? Do you think that, like, how do you think that that Neuralink is going to play out? Agree or disagree with any of my uh, premises or assertions? Uh, but yeah, this is my honest appraisal of the technology and where it's going. I think it'll be interesting. I Like I said, I disagree with some of the premises. Um, I think that there's better options for the technology today. But yeah, tell me what you think in the comments. Uh, cheers. Have a good one. Like and subscribe, et cetera, et cetera. You know the drill.